You're listening to The Dental Guys, controversial topics surrounding bonding and ceramics with Marcus Vargas. We appreciate the Seattle Study Club hooking us up with a conversation tonight and today with Marcus Vargas, a longtime fanboy myself of Marcus. We bring him on the podcast to talk about some of the greatest topics the dental guys have talked about for years. What's going on? Why are your crowns coming off? Is it because you're not bonding Emacs? Is it because you're not bonding Zirconia? Can you even bond these products? Can you loot them? We're going to ask him a little bit about like, well, some of these newer generation bonding uh, agents. I mean, is there really, are they, is it possible to put everything in one bottle and make it happen just right with enamel and dentin? We talk about this and so much more this week on The Dental Guys. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com to learn more today. Well, hi, and welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm John, The Dental Guy. And I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I know that you are in crazy mode right now because things are changing in the studio. Tell us why today is an important day in the Wes Mullins Dental Guy studio. John, this has been the background, right? That picture right there. Um, yep. for a long time for Wes the Dental Guy. And right. um, this happens to be the very last recording in this particular home studio. Things will be changing. Mm. And, um, you know, it's kind of bittersweet. There's been other backgrounds behind me, but then I think this one has lasted the longest. I mean, it's changed a little bit over the past probably year or so. Um, as you know, you have time to kind of just, I've got, I've gotten bit. used to it. I've gotten yeah. used to it. I mean, so what are you, what's going to, is something going to change here? What, well, what's going on? Well, we're moving, right? But oh yes. This is Secret the first time. time we've moved from a house in 15 years, John. Okay. Man. No, let's say seven, almost 17 years. Okay. So you so, accumulated some stuff. Man, let me just tell you this, like the, I clean the attic, right? The attic is a curse in a house. Oh, and, oh yeah. You know, when you grow <laughs> it's up. It's unknown. You don't see it. It's like full of things that you thought you things. didn't. You're right. And you've already bought three more of whatever's up there. You didn't even know you had it. Yeah, it's going to mm. be bad. And boxes. I found out I'm a box keeper, right? You buy, you know, mm. uh, an AV um, you know, whatever, or some type of like camcorder or some type of like speaker system. <laughs> and this is going back 15 years. Oh man. And let me oh, tell you right man. now, you know, we've got two, we've just had two in case you needed to eBay it or something like just in case, like I mean, why do you, you think boxes, right? Why do <laughs> I you don't keep, keep boxes? boxes. I'm not, that I guy. keep them. Do you have you have an emotional attachment to your boxes. Oh, tonight yeah. I threw boxes right. away. I threw boxes away. Um, How did but, that make you feel? Oh, man, I'm liberated. Like, you know, I feel like that I've grown <laughs> up in... <laughs> liberated. I feel liberated. like that I've grown up in this house, though. You know, like I graduated dental school, mm. bought this house, and um, my wife and I talked about this. We had two children here, so both of our children... Mm. It's a lot. Um, you know, <clears throat> were raised you know, not fully in this house, but, you know, most of their lives, they've lived in this house, all of their lives. And so yeah. I, I also know that we like, because we had two girls, you know, and you, you, you yep. do this, right? You you pass clothes down, right? You, you keep sure. the best of what's not ragged and you put it in storage and you get it out and all that. Well, sometimes you just keep things like, oh, well, we'll use that later or we'll give that to somebody. Well, my yep. wife told me we had 44 bags of clothes up there. Oh, bags. <clears throat> You're going to make some crazy. people's day. But, you know, that's with the change in the studio. I, mm. I'll i miss 
this original studio, but I know your new one will be bigger and better than mm -hmm. ever. And you know, the dental guys continues to march on, although it's probably going to be a crazy couple of weeks. So oh, man. be looking forward to seeing the new Wes Mullins dental guys studio coming up soon today, Wes, this is something that we've been kind of aiming for. We talked about getting mm -hmm. Marcos Vargas on the show, uh, years ago mm -hmm. when you had seen him locally. And now yeah. we have him. We'll we'll save the official intro, you know, for when we have him on here in just a minute. But um, you got to be excited about this because he taught you some stuff, some common sense stuff years ago about composite. I remember you telling me about this was a long time ago, and now he's going to mm -hmm. be here with us. Yeah, I, I think that one of the things that I, I, I like about him is he is, has a practical way about how to do things. And you know, mm. another thing that I liked about him is he seemed to me like he was an instruction reader, right? And I'm that guy, yeah. right? I like to read yeah. the instructions yeah. and follow the rules. And um, sure. so I think this is going to be a really good podcast. We're going to talk a lot about material science. I mean, that's kind of like his MO, man, at the University oh, yeah. of Iowa. Um, and, man, I'm excited about this, John. And so after a word from our sponsor, we're going to bring you this interview with Marcos. Vargas. Hi, I'm Justin Goodbrand with Financially Simple. So perhaps you're considering buying your first practice or your second, third, or fourth. Here's a tip for you. Oftentimes I see young associates rush out and start their own practice without considering whether or not they're suited for ownership. Did you know that your personality type can be a key factor in the success or failure of your practice? Now, of course, it's possible to succeed regardless of your personality type, but certain personalities are just better suited to own businesses. For more information about this and other dental related topics, visit financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information. Well, welcome to this interview and this special, really, collaboration with the Seattle Study Club. John and I were asked uh, by them to maybe bring on some of the people that they have really allowed uh, to speak in their group. And uh, we're so excited to have Marcus Vargas uh, with us tonight. Welcome to the show, uh, Dr. Vargas, and thank you so much for taking a little time out of your evening to join us tonight. No, thank you very much. I am very excited, very happy to be here today, uh, uh, spending some time with you guys and your uh, audience. So I'm excited. Yeah. Well, before we get into talking a little bit about some shop questions, you know, and, and dentistry, you know, one of my first experiences uh, years ago was, um, you know, a, a little CE event that 3M put on in my town here in Knoxville. I was invited by my 3M rep to come to a, a composite course. And John and I mentioned in one of our episodes a couple years back, I think, John, it was cheap but good CE. And it's a shame right now because of, you know, what the, the, the climate that we're in that some of these hands-on things aren't po uh, possible. And I think that'll come back because there's just no substitute for face-to-face -face interaction. And you were collaborating with 3M at the time, and uh, we did uh, some practical, hands-on, posterior composites, some Class two stuff, some anterior uh, shading. We talked about, like, how to take shades properly. We even made a shade guide out of composite. I thought that these were very practical things, and I immediately went back and ticked and took those things, sat down with my team, and kind of represented <laughs> what you presented. And um, from there, um, it really helped me to have confidence as a younger dentist um, in building my composite general dentist practice. And, and we talk about that doing composites is probably one of the hardest things that we do efficiently and effectively as a young dentist. And uh, John and I, I think we mentioned this back years ago on the show, is like, when do you think you figured out how to do composites? And we said, man, man it was about 10 years of practicing, right? I mean, it's yeah. it's one of those things. It's a labor of love. I mean, I did, and today even, I was thinking about this podcast, and I'm doing the last procedure I did today was 
a DO on DOL on 14 and an MOD on 15 with 16 still present. And, and I was thinking about some of the things even then that I'm using, some of the techniques that you showed there was applied. So I really appreciate you coming on our show. We're not just going to talk about composite dentistry tonight. We're going to talk a lot about adhesives, but that's kind of what your influence in my, in my career has been. And I've followed you, um, you know, since then, and some of the things that you've, you've published, um, you talk a lot about um, one of the most recent things I think that I saw in JPD was the effect of material shade and the thickness um, you know, and how translucency and the, the shade, the prep shade affects things. And, and then also, too, um, you've talked a lot about composites and, and making posterior placement easier. Those are some things. And then you're big into photography, which is one of the things that John and I um, really have incorporated in our practice in a big way with DSLRs and all that. But you're teaching right now, um, but we really want to, you to kind of spend a little time about what you're doing right now and maybe your journey in getting into what you're doing and kind of let's kick off the show that way and then we'll get into some some uh, dentistry topics absolutely no uh, thank you very much for your kind words uh, it's always um very rewarding uh, when somebody really have listened to you and comes back and and tells me that some of the things that i taught it is helping them and helping so as a teacher, it's just, that's what I guess for every teacher aspires, you know, that help people. I think that's what a teacher in essence is, help, help. So, you know, um, again, thank you for your kind words. Um, so to tell you a little bit about me, I was born in Peru uh, many, many moons ago. I am not even say it. Um, I went to school in Peru. Um, by all the standards, I think. My father is a dentist, um, so that's probably why I went to the profession. I knew he loved his profession, he loved his family, um, and I kind of, uh, you know, always look up to him, and so I say dentistry is something that uh, kind of I like, it, seeing what he does, and so I, that's what I went into dentistry. Then I spent, uh, after I finished dental school, I spent four years uh, working for my father, and then he always, um, try us to say, you have to be better, you have to be better. And, you know, he's like, you have to go to the States, get a specialty and come back. So I, I my wife and I in that time um, came, my wife, ex-wife, I guess a dentist. We went to Rochester, New York for a couple of years. She did a training in pediatric dentistry and I did my residency in IAGD actually, Advanced Education in General Dentistry. And then we came to Iowa and then she got a PhD here and I did my master's degree in operative dentistry. Great mentors, Jerry Dennehy, uh, so many people that I have to only thank uh, during my stay in Iowa. And on that time, when I finished my residency, um, my mentor, Dr. Dennehy, asked me, would you have any interest in staying here as a faculty and teach? Because <clears throat> obviously you like the teaching, you've been teaching in Peru, and I said, well, I don't know. So I talked to my wife, and in that time, we said, well, you know what? We want to go back to Peru, but, well, let's give it a try, a couple of years. And two years later, well, you know, it's been 27 years that I've been in Iowa. Hmm. Iowa, wow. I, yeah, long time. So that's kind of my little bit of um, my story, yeah. how I came to and Iowa. Tell us, and <clears throat> tell us a little bit about just essentially – you know, what are some of the things that right now are kind of your your interests in, whether it be, you know, teaching, research, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about, and you know, kind of the topic that we had, we had seen kind of thrown around is controversies in uh, dental ceramics. And uh, talk a little bit about, has that been, you know, kind of your journey with ceramics? And uh, why is that a topic that you're excited about uh, now? Uh, absolutely, you know, ceramics. Is, I comes from the aesthetic world. You know, I like, I love, always like aesthetics. You know, it's a very interest of mine. So, with materials, with composites, the ceramics being aesthetic materials, always want to have an interest in all these aesthetic materials, all restorative materials in general, but a little more toward aesthetics. 
So I always been um, in the research side. I always uh, done some research, obviously using the publications, and I use the materials all the time. This is that's what I, I teach to the students, to the senior dental students. That's the area that I really uh, teaching to the students. Um, again, my research is in the really in the worlds of adhesives. I was lucky enough to have a sabbatical year. I had a chance to work with uh, Barman Birvik in Belgium. Um, mm. A lot of people mm -hmm. see this as the as a great guy in, compo in adhesive, or he <clears> is. <throat> so I had lucky. I, I was lucky to spend some time there in Belgium. You know, do some did some research there, and came back and continued my research in adhesives. But I moved my path, move a little more towards uh, clinical. So um, I my research is diminished through the years uh, because I think my uh, role as a teacher, as a mentor, has increased with the students. So that's what I. Nowadays, I do a lot of um, mentoring and a lot of teaching of restorative materials, including ceramics and everything. And as you say, it's been, a, it's been quite a change, you know, because I've been for the last mm. 27 years, 20, 20, 30 years. It's changed so much uh, since the first uh, ceramic that came out, in, uh, came into the market by uh, a dense ply. I, um, what was the name of that ceramic that they first came out, of, which is pure glass? and didn't last very long they only good for interiors um to evolution of the ceramics right now we have then through emax to all those things and now with all the zirconias so it's, it's been quite a quite a journey you know to go through all these uh, yeah. changes in ceramics now what do you think are some of the greatest controversies that are for today in ceramics you know what are so let's let's kind of talk through that you know because that's what we want to kind of dive into today with some of our discussion is, you know, what are these controversies? And, you know, you ask 10 people, they'll probably tell you 10 different controversies because there's so many things that have discussed over the years. But what do you think are some of the most important areas in ceramics that are still controversial today? I think it's still zirconia can be quite controversial because I think we sometimes we use the word zirconia, but you know, zirconia is just multiple zirconias. There is not only one, right? So by composition, there are so many types of zirconia. So finally, I think with the students, we've been able to break through um, that there are not one zirconia, there are multiple zirconias. And then now when we do a treatment plan or something like that, we'll go and say, okay, we're going to do a zirconia, but also qualify the zirconia. The student will tell us, I'm going to do a, a, mol a crown and a molar, and then we're going to use uh, four white zirconia, or an anterior, mm -hmm. I'm going to use a five white mm -hmm. zirconia. So that, I think it still is controversial, um, because it's just how we think about zirconia being unique, or only one, when in mm -hmm. reality there are so many zirconias. I think that's still um, controversial. And these new five white, more translucent zirconias are obviously not as strong as the original or the three white zirconias, right? Um, so that I still, um, people doesn't realize that they are weaker. Uh, sometimes in the conversations with the lab, we just, in the script, you, uh, we write, please fabricate a zirconia crown. And I tell the students, it's kind of like going buying a car. Mm -hmm. It's like, what do you mean? They say, well, it's kind of like, a, well, what about a car? What car mm -hmm. do you want? Oh, I just want a car. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, what do you right. want, a truck? What do you want? So. Finally, this year, we, we got, got to the students to think about, okay, when you say I'm going to do a zirconia or any ceramic, you have to qualify what's either ceramic, what's zirconia, or what are you going to do based on... Now, while we're, while we're on this, because this is such a good, I know we have more controversies we'll get to, but just to stop there for a moment and kind of sit there for a second, what do you think, because you know, we know about 3Y from Bruxer and kind of the original materials that have been definitely very well proven now to be very durable and uh, stand the test of time. Um, the 5Y, I want to talk about that a little bit and kind of see what your thoughts are on this because it seems like um, you hear different sides of this. You know, one side is that 5Y is uh, because of increased translucency, that this is a material that we should really be using. Then you also have another side of this, which people say, well, why would I use that over just Emacs, assuming that you are looting both materials, which we can get into that. But I've also heard from, you know, for instance, clinicians report, which is not, you know, a peer reviewed journal, but still 
even reporting issues of a uh, fracture upon cementation of some five Ys or Coney and Crown. So I guess the question for you is, you know, what is your view on where should we be using five Ys or Conia and why would we choose it over Emacs? That's a good question. And I think you can make the argument both ways. Uh, you can play devil advocate either side, right? So Emacs is a material that obviously has been proven for years. It has a very good track record. You know, you look at the literature, it's, a, it's an excellent material. We nowadays consider good strength for most, most situations. And then you have five Y zirconia that is a weaker zirconia. And, but this new zirconia, I will be a little hesitant yet to use. And the reason is those, those yeast that Emax has over uh, the five Y zirconia. So that's what I will think based on that history that I will be more um, inclined to do Emax because I already know really the strengths and limitations when to use it. Um, all these years we have learned when to use it and when not to use it. That I would rather go with Emax that a lot of cases with a translucent zirconia. That's kind of a, my thought it is. And again, you know, you, like you said, you ask five dentists, you ask five different, uh, you have five different answers. But I will still, I'm very partial to um, Emacs. Again, for reports like that, you talk about the um, um, Gordon Christensen, that he, um, he reported that a lot of the, cra the, the, the crowns will fracture on cementation. So I don't know if I want to be in that cutting edge and get blunted, right. especially, you know, you guys are in practice, right? So I don't want to go to a patient, the patient comes back to me with a crown, broken crown, right? After a month, two months breaks, you know, that we know that, that that's the worst case. That's the worst day at the office because we are not, not making money. We are losing money. We are mm -hmm. losing money. We are losing um, patient confidence. So I'd rather go for the sure thing with my patients instead of, rescue myself later on with scenes that they're a little bit too cutty edgy you know what i mean or um the the, the promised lane of this zirconia that is very translucent and very strong but there is still some reports fracturing and breaking so i will listen to that and say well maybe i should back it up a little bit and maybe um, keep using my emacs a little like i've been using in the past and giving me good results let me ask and you this is... a little away from the five y is the 5Y zirconia the result of the market um, industry pushing its zirconia and the research was not there before the market pushed it, right? So we had this product, zirconia, and everybody developed a like, oh my, it's a strong product. It's the strength. And dentists are all about engineering things if they break it build it stronger it's just what we kind of have that mentality so did the market outpace the research with this i will say definitely be yes i will say it's a yes i don't think there is again um any long-term data with five wives zirconia to tell us you know what percentage i stay in after five years six seven mm -hmm. eight ten years you know but but i think is this is common in dentistry that phenomena that you describe that products, uh, products, materials come to the market before they are tested. It's in every area, not only zirconia, not only in ceramics, but also in adhesives, composites, and mm. a lot of things that they're kind of a little bit that way. I think as a dentist, we're always looking for what is new, what is best, what is fast. And sometimes um, we, we hear from uh, a rep or somebody and that sometimes, unfortunately, that's how we get our information. Mm. And you know, it's kind of, there is the whole, you know, PR and advertisement mm -hmm. that comes without necessarily a very good uh, scientific fundamentals. Seems like to me, Absolutely. too, one of the things that's interesting about zirconia, and I, I know that currently when I use a zirconia crown, it's a 3Y crown, but the laboratory that I'm using, and they are familiar with zirconia because of how long they've been using it and I'm talking like since 2000 I want to say 2003 2004 
And one of the things that's interesting about them is how they've learned to develop the, uh, the color, right, the illusion of translucency through high-level staining techniques. Like before you're centering zirconia, this layering, and some of these things even from Zircon Zon and other companies, it's just amazing to me what they can do mm-hmm. and still maintain this, this strength, but yet it looks... And, and, and then there's this certain, you know, they're artist, you know, when it comes to even zirconia, right? And this staining. And uh, it's interesting to me. Do you have experience with maybe someone that's done some things with staining and, and using the stronger zirconia 3Y? Yeah, actually, you know, in um, the clinics and my experience is like, um, of course, you know, price of metals in the work, the labor, PFMs are become really very, very expensive. You know, some of the lab is $350, mm-hmm. $400 for a PFM and, you know, insurance companies don't, they're not paying as much and, and all these things. I think that's why, uh, one of the reasons why Circonia is so popular, you know, is the price is, is, is obviously a big advantage. Also, it's, uh, they're very resistant, very strong. So obviously the, the three wise have proven through the years. And that's what I particularly use in my patients in the posterior of the mouth. I will use three white zirconia stain. And look, the, the technician is in the hands of the technician. Of course, they are good because they've been learning these for the last 15 years, 10, 15, 20, almost, almost 20 years of zirconia, maybe 15 years that, uh, or more mm-hmm. that, you know, doing a very good staining will make it look very nice and natural. Of course, you know, that's three white zirconia. Um, it changes to a little more aesthetic in the, de- in the, the development of these uh, three Y. It's three Y, but they reduce certain uh, components. Alumina was reduced and things like that to make it a little more translucent. <clears throat> so there's three Y first generation, it's called a three Y second generation that is a, a little more translucent, it's still a three Y, but I think it's mm-hmm. a very good crown in a, a highly used, I would say, across the United States, as far as I uh, know with the data from laboratories. Yeah. 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 Well, let's talk about some other controversial topics in ceramics. What, uh, what else, what else is, uh, what else is kind of qualifies for that? Um, I would say maybe um, a little bit in, into the um, bonding versus cementing. You know, I think it's some people mm. will say, oh, you always need to bond. So people will say it's not necessarily you can cement in certain circumstances. And well, you know, I think when I, when we talk about it, uh, when we cement, when to bond, I think there is a couple of requirements that I think are necessary for somebody to cement and not bond. Hmm. Um, of course, when you look at cementation versus bonding, as a dentist, I want to cement. I do not want to mm-hmm. bond because right. it's more technique sensitive, takes me longer time to do it. Um, so I wanna always wanna try to cement. But I think there are two prerequisites that it needs to be met before we can cement a lithium disilicate. One is that it's, it's enough resistance and retention form because a conventional cementation, if you don't have good retention, will come out. So prerequisite number one is that you have retention. And prerequisite number two is the thickness of the material. And that in itself is controversial because originally uh, Emax came out as a minimum requirement was 1.5 millimeters. Through the years, I think um, now it can be argued that it can be a little less than that, maybe 1.2. Some people will argue one, I, I will say, stay in the conservative side at 1.2. Um, so if you have good resistance and retention form and good material thickness in the occlusal, 1.2 as a minimum, the axial is not as important in thickness, more important is the occlusal. Then if you have those two prerequisites, I think you can cement. Mm-hmm. On the other side, on the contrary, on the flip side of the coin, if you don't have both, you only have one, you need to bond that lithium disilicate. Mm. Now, mm. you mentioned retention, <clears throat> and I want to stay there for a moment because yes. we've had uh, so many discussions over <clears throat> really the last couple of years of the show. It keeps coming back up 
um, about crowns coming off, uh, specifically zirconia crowns coming off. And this is, uh, is a topic that goes back a few years, and yet you still hear about this from dentists saying, you know, my crowns are coming off. Uh, it's the lab. I think I think I need to switch labs. Uh, you know, I think that I need to switch cements. I think that I need to switch crowns, whatever it might be. I'm going back to PFM. I mean, it's it depends on on the clinician. We've had some interesting discussions with laboratories. I'm getting my glass about, lab you know, back two, out, John. I'm getting my glass yeah, lab back Yeah, it's time out. to go back Zinc to the glass phosphate. lab in the fridge. I mean, yeah, forget that's all right. this new stuff. <laughs> but one of the things that the lab will say uh, is they will say that, number one, preps are getting worse. Uh, a lot of labs will say that they are see a lot of issues with prep design. Uh, but then there's also this other setting that you can put into the machine as far as essentially die space. Here we go. And, uh, you know, if you have worse prep design, the last thing the lab wants is to have crowns get sent back because they won't go uh, onto the prep. So I think some of them might design their die space to be a little wider and and you know so I, I wonder if you could weigh in on that you know why do you what do you think the issue is with crowns coming off while we're on the subject of retention you know what is it that uh is causing the problem and then maybe what are some things that we should focus on as we're preparing our crowns as far as design both from a reduction standpoint resistance and retention form you know what are some of the things that you feel are most important uh, but, but first of all, what, what do you think is, is the cause of these, of these problems? Yeah, I, I do believe the cause of the problems is it's, it's, it's ourselves. The, we dentists, I think as what you say is, I, I think you just say very clearly, like the labs, when I talk to the lab technicians, they really show me some preps that, you know, um, they're deficient preps, meaning over taper preps, uh, things like that. And, um, I think that's part of it. Uh, a, a lot of, uh, I would say that's what I think it is based on my conversation with the technicians, what I've seen. So I think as a dentist, we need to um, pay a little more attention to these things. Uh, I think uh, maybe it's just part of the problem is that, oh, silicone is a silver bullet, 3Y is a silver bullet when, well, it, there's no silver bullet, right? So I think as a dentist, we need to pay attention a little things that we're, going, we're doing to be able to create a, a prep that is retentive, that we have enough resistance and retention form and have enough thickness for the material to develop to the full um, properties or full potential. So as a dentist, we need to um, look at ourselves and look at our preps. And uh, now with digital dentistry, um, and because obviously zirconias are made digitally, correct? And they cannot be made by the lost was techniques. So we can look at our preps very magnified way in, in, in improve all the things we were doing. I think over tapering could be one of those things. Um, um, preparation, I think also the cementation protocol is quite important. Uh, I think we sometimes maybe try to rush through these steps too. Um, isolation is very critical to a very good um, retention or, or saying of the crown. So those are the things that I believe why the crowns are coming off. Uh, I think we have very good materials out there in the market able to hold these restorations, you know. Um, like I, I will say um, for zirconia, I will say we'll need to use something that is good retention. You know, if we're not bonding, I would like to say that um, the easiest materials to use are resin modified glass ionomer cements in terms of mm -hmm. cement and silicone, right? But also, if I have very good retentive prep, that's basically what I'm going to do because the resin modified glass ionomer is the easiest to clean and, and, and mm. see is for, for why you can see, you can clean it. Um, so I will say that's kind of the most popular cement just because it's easy of use. Now, there are cases that I because that happens to everybody right you have a second molar and it's a very short crown and nothing really matter how much retention you can get into that one it's a short crown mm. we, we, we do all the time that happens to us all the time so mm. in a very short crown i have the reduction but it's a very short walls what am i going to do well 
goes back to if I don't have enough resistance and retention form, then I have to use something stronger to bond. Maybe not necessarily going through the bonding, but maybe use a um, self-adhesive resin cement that is going to give me extra mm -hmm. retention, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Because we have the ceramic and then we have the choice of the cement. We can cement a resin modified glass ionomer cement or that. We can bond with an adhesive at a resin cement or maybe a little bit in between, not to say a little bit between, but a little more than just the resin modified glass ionomer cement is the uh, self-adhesive resin cements that I, I think they're, they provide better retention than resin modified glass ionomer cements. Mm -hmm. That's good. So in a typical, uh, I mean, for you, it sounds like that unless there's an issue, just to kind of recap that, unless there's an issue with resistance and retention form or material thickness, if you have both of those are sufficient for lithium bisilicate, um, you're looting where in, in, in with uh, resin modified glass ionomer, is that, is that fair to say? That's very fair to say, yes. Okay. Well, John, I think I feel a little bit better already, right? That's right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, I, I don't like being wrong, but I mean, I don't mind being wrong, you know, and it's whenever you're wrong that you learn maybe more, right? If you're right sure. all the time and if you stay inside your little hole and you listen to yourself and, um, but, you know, this is something that took me a while to really trust um, is looting, and John knows my story on this. I'm not going to tell it tonight, but looting lithium disilicate Emacs um, took me a while to really get comfortable with, and and actually moving from um, actually what you said was that I used to be a um, you know dual cured resin right guy, a Unisim right this this uh, self etching resin cement guy, and everything right everything got that and a lot of people were doing that and then we found out that hey it, it could be you, you do still need that right you still need that for the right application an intentional application but let me tell you the first time that you bond your crown to the adjacent tooth right and you don't get it cleaned up enough it makes you really think like what am I, why am I using this? <laughs> because we've or the been first there. time that you have to cut off uh, oh. multiple bonded lithium disilicate crowns, um, yes. which that that's actually something that uh, is interesting. It's worse we, were than out at, uh, we were out at one of our, our courses recently in the last couple of years, and we had uh, one of the faculty at it, uh, what Greg Kinzer talking about, you know, how do you get a whole arch, a full uh, reconstruction off? Uh, when you have bonded Emacs, and he talked about that we might even have to invest in lasers, lasers. simply to uh, basically explode this Emacs off of the tooth because it was the only efficient way. Because you would, you know, how many hand pieces are you going to go through, uh, you know, if you're having to to cut these things off? So it does make you think mm -hmm. about what are we saddling the next generation with if we're bonding these. But I think the question is, do we need to? And I think it's good to kind of hear this, you know, reconfirmation that, again, assuming you have the right parameters in place, um, it really just, it comes back to the material and it comes back to the prep. Um, now, I wonder, while we're talking about material selection in terms of strength versus aesthetics and translucency, um, there was a time when we used a lot of feldspathic uh, mm. porcelain for, say, veneers. And, you know, so lithium disilicate came along and changed a lot about what we do with aesthetic dentistry. You mentioned earlier, you know, that you always had that interest in aesthetics. Do you think that with what we have now, kind of turning more the conversation to the aesthetic side, um, can we do enough with layered uh, Emacs or cutback Emacs, I should say, um, versus what we can do with layered feldspathic ceramics. You know, do you, is there still a, a place for for the old standby, um, the artistry of layering, you know, powder porcelain? Yeah, I do. I, th I do believe that there's room for feldspathic in certain cases. I think it's. I would never say um, every case can be done with Emax. I think in general terms, if somebody says. I use most of my cases, I do most of my cases with um, Emacs, 
I think that's a, that's what I probably my category is. I tried to do Emacs um, because I think Emacs is it can be done very beautifully. Like you say, if you really need the high aesthetic, um, the technician is going to cut it back and put feldspathic on top. So the aesthetics is going to be there if necessary. Also talking about uh, different things, right? Um, the price of things. Uh, I think uh, Emacs for the general dentist, it's a it's a good price uh, that give you very good aesthetics. Now, if you really your patient is that into aesthetics and all the nuances, the translucencies, that is rarely we have one of those. Maybe that's a room, that's a place that maybe feldspathic will be better if the patient is that demanding, and your technician feels that they can do a better job with feldspathic than with Emacs. But I do believe, again, 99% of the cases can be done really well uh, with uh, um, lithium disilicate, Emacs. So I, um, I will say there's room, but I think it depends on the situation, depends on the dentist and what are the demands, what are the patient's demands. Right. Yeah, but like, you know, my it. technician is very good at doing it. Yeah, I stick yeah. with my technician does really beautiful uh, Emacs stain like we're talking about the technician kind of same beautiful three y zirconia well they can do as a beautiful of a job uh, staining custom staining uh, anterior uh, emacs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so one of the things about emacs today is that a lot of emacs is being milled okay and they're is there are a lot of situations and you're describing them right now where in the anterior you have minimal prep and you're you're actually uh, going to have you know margins that you know are going to disappear at the cervical line angle and uh, you may have you know even the type of veneer prep that you do will have you know, different types of chamfers and things like that. When I'll get into all the details there, but what this, uh, for a, for a milling machine, right? Because Emacs is milled no matter what milling machine you have at a one to one ratio. It's not like zirconia that's milled 25% larger per se. And, you know, it's a lot easier to mill zirconia than it is lithium disilica because of this one to one. I would like to ask you, do you feel like that milling technology has arrived, right? And if it has arrived, right, um, is, is it, at first has it arrived, right? Or are we still needing to do some things uh, with lost wax technique, those type of things that are kind of like tried and true, we understand how to marginate those things? Or are we going towards milling and then thinning the ceramic, thinning the lithium disilicate by hand in the finishing phases of that. And then how much does prep matter when prepping zir zirconia versus lithium disilicate? Like which preps have to be better, right? I want you to speak to those things. All right. That's a lot. Um, let's, just, let's just start with the milling. I think the milling still has some disadvantages, right? Because like you're saying, uh, to mill it, you have to have certain thickness to mill it. If it's just too thin, this, the Emacs or the uh, lithium disilicate or zirconia will cheap at the margins. So you have to have certain thickness to mill it, right? So um, if you don't have the right thickness, then it will cheap. So that's why the technician mills it thicker and thin it so you can have that margin. Um, I think it's a lot of the communication between you and your laboratory uh, technician is how is the best way that they can do the things that you wanted to do. For example, um, some of the cases that I have, like the minimal invasive, my technician is going to say, you know what, um, I, I always have this relation with my technician and I, <clears throat> usually when I choose a cer ceramic, I will think about the functional demands in the mouth and the aesthetics. So that's the balance in what I'm doing, right? So mm -hmm. when it's an anterior crown, it's heavily based on aesthetics more than in function, right? Course function is important, but aesthetics is much more important in the anterior than in the posterior. So I always 
talk to my technician, I say, you know what, in this particular case, um, I'm doing a single crown, uh, two number seven, let's call it. And I say, well, you know, the patient has a very good occlusion, uh, good anterior disclusion, uh, canine guidance, um, group function, let's say, in the protrusive. So functionally, I tell my technician, don't worry about it because any ceramic probably will work. Now I ask my technician, what are you going to use to give me the aesthetics based on there is no functional demands? And he, he can say anything, right? He can say, well, this particular case, mm -hmm. I'm going to do with Emax. And I say, perfect, right. you do with Emax. So I put it in his hands to, because I trust my technician mm. to tell me how he's going to get the result that I want. He might say, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but the only way I can do that case is feldspathic. And I say, go for it. So I think there's the case dependent and who is your technician? how comfortable he he feels doing certain materials right mm -hmm. like i use i thought you may have heard about this there is a protocol called elab for shade selection elab e l a b elab is um is a the technician that developed this is ah his name is escaping right me right now from germany um anyway so he developed a system that you take a, a photograph we put a light and a gray car in that raw information, that raw file you take with the picture, you send it to the technician. And there is a software that tells the technician what ceramics to use to give you the perfect match. So, yeah. um, so it's, it's unbelievable. So I have a lot of cases that I don't even select a shade anymore for my anterior ceramics. I take the photo with the gray car, put a filter, and I send it to him and I say, okay, what are you going to do? And he says, you know what? To really give you that match, I'm going to use zirconia. Anterior zirconia, yeah. um, um, porcelain fused to zirconia. I say, perfect. That's aesthetic demands that I'm putting on you. You say you are going to get it that way. Go for it. Get it that way. So tell us so what the name the of this is here. This is, this is good stuff. <clears throat> what is the this name? Is e Lab. E Lab. E L A B. E L A B. Okay. E Lab. So you can find it, you know, if you are a Facebook. Well, I think everybody's Facebook anymore. Um, look for eLab because there is they have a page. Okay. Um, I, I cannot remember the name of him. He's a super nice guy, down to earth. I talk to him when mm. he speak at meetings. Um, what is his name? Ah, I'm going to drive crazy. I'm going to drive myself crazy trying to remember <laughs> his name. Well, that's all right. So, so, but the idea is you use a gray card to kind of to the, in, in a certain polarizing filter and they have kind of a, a kit that allows to just stand it's just standardization of shade so you're not actually holding shade tabs up on a lot of these cases it's more just standardizing between the dentist and the lab technician what uh, what they're seeing on the monitor correct because that gray okay. car it has certain value and certain range mm -hmm. So it's the same compared to a beta panche guy that your A1 might not match mine and not my, match my technicians or anybody else's, right? That usually the literature is clear that there's a lot of discrepancy between the che guys. Like yes. A2, your A2 yes. is not same as mine. So that takes that into account. So to that, this great car is their standard. And then you have the polarized light and the polarized light filters cut all the glare so there is no glare in the picture. Like with a DSLR, the gotcha. flash, you get the glare. This takes the glare and then you send this raw photo to the technician. The technician will have a software that analyzes the images and tells them a combination of ceramics to use, specifically measure the ceramic to be able to obtain that coloration at a different levels. Because it's a computer, you can measure every color throughout the crown. And you can come up with yep. different scenes. So um, okay. the technician also, the, the big deal is that the technician, because you send him the photo, he also has that gray car and a camera. So he takes the photo with the gray car and a camera of the crown and does a digital try-in. So brings the photo ah. he's taken with the photo you send him, right? And then in the computer, you have the patient and the crown he's made photographic under the same conditions and he can say it and he can measure in the software it says these two crowns are slightly different i need to tweak it 
Oh, there you hmm. go. That's Elam. What is his okay. name? What so, is... Uh, Mysica. Is that sound right? Uh, uh, not Peter no, Mysica. I, think... I don't know if that's that's maybe not the no, one who developed it. I'm just looking at their okay, site. Okay, the, the guy that is to the right, right here, taking the photograph. He is the one. What's his name? Um, I need to figure it out too. Uh, no, yeah. it's not him. It's um, he love. Oh, that's all right. We'll oh, find. We'll find oh, it. You know we'll find who, it as we're talking. Yes. Oh, you know who who sells the uh, PhotoMed? Have you heard of PhotoMed? Oh yeah. PhotoMed. Yeah, we've used PhotoMed a lot of their is stuff. the one that sells. Yeah, PhotoMed is the one that sells all the camera equipment and everything. So when you go to PhotoMed, you can find in PhotoMed the filters, the close polarized filters. And the, and the name is Sasha Hein, H Hein, -E okay, okay. That's Sasha Hein. Okay. That's the name of the guy that developed it. So if you go to the PhotoMed okay. website and you can see me at the close polarizer, you can click on it and, and you see the pictures and you see everything. You know, okay. this is PhotoMed. Okay. That's right interesting. Here. So then you can see it, right? And they give the instructions out of there, the polarizing filters out of there. Um, and again, it, so is it? So this is. A lot. So this is. Is this mainly for value, or is this for really your entire shade take? Is is done using this system? The whole I mean, entire thing is uh, the whole everything. shade taking so, is a picture. Wow, everything. So this is it's a game just changer. A single picture. Wow, <laughs> this could be a game. This changer. could be a game changer. We have seen. Okay, so let's kind of stick here for just a minute. Okay, because we have seen. Uh, polarize and it's one of those things that you're like man that's great because that just kind of takes the gloss off and you can really see the value but then it's like man do I really need that but then this goes next level right and takes software and it looks like some kind of algorithms <clears throat> that they're using in software and and you hold that little gray card up there against the tooth that you're trying to match and you know what John they show the classic hardest thing to do, right, is to match a single central to adjacent teeth, right? I mean, that is the mm -hmm. hardest thing we do is to prep one crown in the anterior. That's why we talk our patients into doing more dentistry. But right, right. Over, over my career, right, you've seen it is these electronic shade takers, x right, easy shade, mm -hmm. and we thought, man, that's going to be it. But it keeps coming back to just good old DSLR photography, right? And right. adding some kind of polarizing filter and now adding this gray reference card, right? And then importing that into software and then they have the ability from there to go from there. And I think you said something that was interesting to me is that shade tabs are not consistent from doctor to lab right or from mm -hmm. dentist to dentist and man that kind of thing can be so frustrating um i'm excited about this i'm gonna do a little research myself how long have you been using this uh, probably about a couple of years now so mm. yeah but mm. a couple of years and very highly success you know and then we are teaching it to the students in the clinics at iowa you know when they have these particular cases they are quite difficult not everybody embrace it um uh, but all the cases that I've done, high success with that photographs. Mm. Now the lab mm. needs to take a course, has to buy the software, needs to uh, take sure. the course, and able to do all this. But I wouldn't. I don't want to do it any other way anymore. I don't want to be spent because that, that's time that you spend and it's frustrating. Yeah. How long does it take okay. to get a shade using the system? You the shade, you just take the photo. So that's it. So it's just the photo, and that's that's it. I mean, it's very quick. Correct. Uh, the photo has certain parameters. The instructions, right? So a certain magnification, you have to have the certain F is required, F22 is required. Um, and then if the photo has all those requirements, it can be read by the system and then they can get you the color you want perfect yeah, matches. So you basically you need a really good camera right you need a nikon or a canon photo med sells these 
John and I have these in our office. You've you've taught this for years yourself, and um, you're incorporating Polarize, which is basically a polarizing filter that um, goes on the front of your your ring flash. Um, and, and then you have this gray card. Now I'm, I'm not an expert at this obviously, but it looks like you need that follow the parameters. You know, you're shooting high F stop and, uh, which gives you the greatest depth of field and less light in to the lens. Um, man, and then the lab software and I'm looking at like the investment here, right? If you've already got a camera, you're looking at investment you know, without the software, the polarized 400 and some dollars, the cards are 60 bucks or something like that. And then the lab has to make an investment. Looks like, um, you know, I don't know, 1000 1500 bucks in software and some training, um, which is yeah, very really not that bad in the, in the scheme reasonable. of things if you're not having to do, you know, four try-ins. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> which you is know, the worst thing only, ever, man. I mean, yeah, exactly. Well, that's that's a good... That's a good little, uh, well, that's little product of there the week, we're John. Both... Product I think of it's the a product week. of the week for sure. It might be. We gotta try it first, you know. Right. right. We'll definitely try it. That's good stuff. And I have. And before we close, because right now we're, we want to respect your time, I do want to just touch briefly because I know you have done a lot of work with bonding, and uh, we've talked about uh, bonding versus looting, and uh, so it kind of gives a little segue into, you know, where do you think we are? Um, today with adhesives just if we could spend just a, a brief moment on um you know when we we interviewed uh harold hyman a while back and he used the interesting terminology which was you know old wine in new bottles and basically saying that not much has really changed uh at that point uh this was a while back now but he said you know much has really changed uh things have kind of been rebranded repackaged but in the end there's certain limitations as you start to try to simplify adhesive mm -hmm. systems into fewer and fewer bottles, uh, fewer and fewer steps that you lose some things. And maybe I, I would want you to weigh in on a couple of things. Is, is that still true today? Do you feel like, you know, we still are in the same era of needing to think about multiple bottle systems, for instance, versus single bottle systems. And especially when it comes to priming, uh, for uh, bonding of, say, lithium disilicate. Uh, so, you know, maybe weigh in on this for composites, but also, you know, is, do we need to be looking for a separate primer, a separate ceramic primer, or is do we truly have universal adhesives that can be used for not only composites, but also for bonding uh, ceramic restorations? Yeah, I, I think, um, like, universals, Yes, I agree with Harald that we have given something to simplify. We lost a little bit of the longevity with the simplification. Um, but these universal adhesives, no, really is a, it was a rebranding of the self-edge one-step adhesive, right? All of a sudden we start calling universal because we start adding things to these bottles to make it supposedly universal. But in reality, we know that it wasn't. Like you look at the literature and in reality, you needed to use um, zirconia primer. I'm, I'm sorry, I take it back. You, you need to use uh, ceramic primer for Emacs because it re they do really bond really well to zirconia because of, all, of the NDP. Uh, but they didn't bond really well to uh, glass ceramics. So I think they are improving upon this like uh, i think 3m mm -hmm. just came out again there is not a lot of literature uh data that they have they have maybe from the dental advisor independent data to say that their new adhesive scotch multipurpose ultra now you can bone to glass ceramics uh, and then the data that i've seen for from the dental advisor again independent data uh it's good so it's much better than the old scotch Moon universal so obviously since are improving, little by little are improving, but um, a little bit agree with Harold that maybe it's old wine in new bottles, but a little bit of uh, not as old wine. I think it's it's improving. Hmm. It's it's getting better. Hmm. Small steps that is getting better. Um, okay. Still, I'd like to see you know uh, um, 
a more hydrophobic layer on top of these universals. You know, I think mm. literature is proving that something more hydrophobic on top uh, is, is conducive to a longer, a long term adhesion better. Mm. Um, now, also, I think there is a big difference between enamel and dentin we need to consider, correct? Mm -hmm. So, I think the most important is a restorative, one of the most important things as a restorative dentist is to try to maintain as much enamel as we can. Mm -hmm. Because there's a big difference between the bone to dentin and enamel. Maintaining the enamel, and especially in the peripheries, it creates a seal that if the bone to dentin suffers eventually, that sealed bone to enamel maintains their status and protects their restoration itself. Mm -hmm. So I think always one of the things is maintain as much enamel as possible when we're trying to bond. Because we know that bonding to enamel is the most reliable that we have. Yeah. Exactly. Well, exactly. Wow. This that's good this stuff. Is, I mean, this has been a great conversation, Wes. I mean, we've covered a lot of ground all the way from you mm -hmm. know some of the controversies uh, in ceramics through you know milling uh, and where we are with that, how to choose some materials. We talked. We we learned something uh, major today potentially about shade matching. Some new products we need to check mm -hmm. out in our own practices. And I think a lot of us, a lot of listeners, if you haven't heard of of that product, I'm sure are looking it up right now. Uh, mm -hmm. as they're, uh, you know, stopping their lawnmowers or pulling over in their cars or, you know, uh, uh, pausing the YouTube that? video feed. What was that? Looking it up. So, uh, first of all, thank you so much, uh, uh, Marcus, for being with us and for sharing your knowledge with us. It's been a lot of fun having you. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's been fun for me, too, to be here and just share some, some time with you guys. I'll enjoy it. And as a teacher, I'll always enjoy it and if you need yeah, a, yeah. Con a contact you want to explore more e-lab you might want to invite him for a podcast yeah. Sasha yeah, that be could be another work. yeah that could be another fun show for sure i think we'll definitely be looking at that because I'm, I'm interested i'm interested wes and um we also want to thank uh seattle study club once again for mm -hmm. helping to uh connect us together uh with dr vargas and get him uh, here with us uh, this evening. So big thanks to them. They're doing some amazing things. Obviously, we see um, some of the names that they're associated with, uh, including Dr. Vargas and many, many others, uh, a couple of whom we may be able to get uh, the chance to speak with over these next few months. Um, it's a real honor to be uh, around passionate people, and uh, clearly that's who they attract to, uh, to their fold. So we're very thankful to them. Uh, if you have listened to this episode of The Dental Guys tonight and or to any time you're listening to this in the coming weeks and months, and it's given you some value for your practice, you've learned something, uh, it's made you think, which we hope it has, uh, then we want to connect with you so that uh, you can tell us uh, what it's doing for you and your practice. So you can connect with us on all the social media outlets, the Facebook, the Instagram, the Twitter. We're there, and uh, and we want to hear from you to let you know, let us know what you thought about this, share your thoughts, share some of your experiences with looting versus bonding, some of your challenges, uh, and also let us know if you enjoyed having uh, Dr. Vargas on the show and let him know, uh, give him some love as well. Of course, you could find him at the University of Iowa. I'm sure he's got all of his contact information there if you have questions directly for, for him as well. Uh, make sure that you go over to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star rating. If you haven't done that, that's, what, that's your job for today. Your job for today is to go and give us a five-star rating. Let uh, That's how we get our message out. That's how people find out about us a lot of times. If they don't know about our show is when they search for Dental Podcasts, we're going to show up there because our listeners have uh, have let us, given us that feedback. So go over and give us a great review. We really appreciate it. We're going to continue to bring you high-level content, always trying to take your practice to the next level. That's what we're all about here, the Dental Guys. 